thank you for the smooth conduct of IZLG 2021. So now I would like to uh, welcome our uh, co-chair, uh, Mr. Sunny Buzan. So he's a doctorate candidate in economics at the IIT Kanpur. So under the supervision of Professor Praveen Prashetra and uh, Dr. Murli Prasad. This area of interest lies in law and economics and his doctoral thesis is uh, dedicated in identifying the hindrance associated with the contractual aspect of housing sector in India and suggesting appropriate policy measures. He has obtained his master's degree in economics from GP, that is Gogla Institute of Political Science and Economics, Pune. He holds a bachelor degree in economics from BHU, Varanasi. He has various experience in teaching uh, courses uh, via TA, tutor and guest faculty from the courses of introductory economics, macroeconomics, law and economics, etc. So we welcome you, uh, Mr. Sunny Busan, sir, for uh, co-chairing this session. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we would like to uh, welcome our uh, chairperson, Shubhangi Rai. So she is a doctoral student and research associate at University of Munster, Germany, under Professor Dr. Peterson. She is part of a global team of uh, researcher found funded by European Research Council to study the judicial interpretation of equal protection classes in different jurisdictions. Her doctoral research is focused on understanding the social and psychological conditions under which individuals comply with different regulation. So the uh, research lies at the intersection of law, economics, and psychology. She is also an Adam Smith Fellow at George Mason University and a Fellow of Law at O.P. Zindar Global University. She obtained her BA, LLB from GNLU and LLM from University of Chicago Law School. So we welcome you, ma'am, uh, to share the session. The session is over to you, ma'am. Uh, so we have all our speakers here, I hope. Yes, ma'am. So we have three papers today. Uh, I'm assuming, do I need to read the regulations for the speakers or do you think they're all on board with the rules? Yes, ma'am, we can go ahead, ma'am. Okay, perfect. So we have three papers today. I think we are starting with the paper by uh, Mr. Aditya Dalal and Mr. Ms. Neha Kaur Arora, they are starting discussing the microeconomics analysis of liquor prohibition in Gujarat. Uh, it's, we, I restrict my comments for only after the presentations are over, but I see a lot of us are, are from GNLU, so this is a very personal topic for all of us. So I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about it. And then I'll introduce the next paper when the next speaker starts. So Aditya, you can take the stage. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, first, I would like to confirm if I'm, if I'm properly audible. Yeah. Thank you so much. Also, can I please share my screen PowerPoint presentation? Yes, ma'am. I hope that the screen is visible. Um, is the screen visible to everybody? Yes, yeah. Thank you. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Today, I, Aditya Dalal, uh, from Gujarat National University, I'm going to present uh, this paper titled A Microeconomic Analysis of Liquor Prohibition in Gujarat. It is indeed an honor to be able to present this paper in front of every uh, distinguished person who is present over here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. This paper has been co-authored by myself and Ms. Meher Kaur Arora, and both of us are um, third year students at Gujarat National Law University. The abstract of the paper uh, goes about that the paper, the present paper aims to examine the impact of the Uh, 
Ma'am, I'm sorry for the interruption. So, Aditya? Aditya, your uh, your voice is not audible, Aditya. I think Aditya having some technical glitches. Do we have the second speaker of the panel here? Because then we could probably start with them and wait for Aditya to get back. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So, Aditya? Sorry for the interruption. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Now you are audible. Uh, could you please uh, make it your PPT as a PPT view? So actually your PPT is not in the PPT view. Uh, so make it as a PPT view. You mean to say that should I um, make it full screen? Ah, yeah. 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 Okay. Is it visible now properly? Ah, uh, wait. Um... Aditya, go to bottom right corner of the uh, window. Yeah, yeah, now it's. Bottom right. But yeah, yeah, perfect, Aditya. Now it's uh, working. You can continue. Thank you so much. And I'll just check if I'm able to switch slides properly. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I shall continue now. And we have also tried in the paper, we have also tried to understand certain positive and negative effects of the prohibition law. And we, at the end, we have tried to provide certain recommendations in conclusive capacity to actually resolve this, uh, uh, the entire debate regarding uh, the prohibition law in Gujarat. Um, I shall only cover the entire presentation part, although my cohort is present here to support me. Um, moving on with the paper, first we have the background of the entire issue at hand. Um, liquor prohibition is something that has um, has been in Gujarat since a lot of years and since 1949 to be very precise. Uh, liquor prohibition has been implemented by various states uh, since the course of independence and however some states have decided to keep it, some states have decided to dispense away with it but basically the, the movement or the call for liquor prohibition started uh, during the independence struggle when alcohol consumption that was initially allowed by British, it was something that was supported by the Britishers and therefore the independent, the people who are fighting for independence, they started to call against liquor uh, prohibition, liquor consumption, so that that became a symbol of resistance to the British and especially with the Gandhian movement that took place and nationalism, particularly in 1940, alcohol was termed as a Western evil, which acted as a distraction to people from their thirst for independence. So that is the premise with which we understand as to why liquor prohibition during the time when India was newly independent had gained so much of popularity and so much of importance. Uh, moving on to the next sub topic that is with respect to the Indian constitution. Um, so even article 47 of the constitution of India, which uh, is a directive principle of state policy, that also states that the state shall reg uh, regard the raising of the level of nutrition and the standard of living of, of its people. So the people who actually, the, the groups that support liquor prohibition, they say that it is the duty of the state to ensure that the citizens are uh, kept away from uh, harmful substances such as liquor, which can have a negative impact on the health of the individual as well as the health of the society. So some states such as Gujarat had implemented this prohibition law. At present, some states such as Gujarat, uh, Bihar, Mizoram, Nagaland have the prohibition law in force. Uh, and also Union Territory of Lakshadweep has prohibited liquor in some of its areas. Uh, the other states that have actually allowed liquor consumption, they have regulated it, they have taxed liquor consumption and it has become a major source of revenue for the uh, liquor, uh, the taxation on 
liquor has become a major source of revenue for the states. Uh, if moving on to the next subtopic of liquor prohibition, prohibition on alcohol or liquor is often viewed by one segment of the society as a form of restriction on individual choices of uh, people to choose as to whether they wish to consume the commodity, the, whether they wish to wish to consume liquor or not. And it is like a manifestation of a paternalistic state and the imposition of the views of a few over the entire society as a whole. The most common tools that are used in order to curb liquor prohibition include restriction on drinking hours, uh, include uh, minimum age requirements to consume alcohol. Obviously, there is taxation, and then there is uh, there are a few states such as Gujarat that have adopted prohibition. While we talk about the scene with respect to liquor prohibition in Gujarat, we see that the demand for liquor or alcohol in Gujarat is pretty inelastic due to which there are a lot of people who still consume alcohol. There are actually a great number of people who still consume liquor irrespective of the fact that it is something that is out, it is outlawed and you might even face a penal repercussions if you if you are found consuming it. And uh, although we are there, it is estimated that about there are 3,500 bootleggers who work all across Gujarat in this illegal supply chain of liquor and also they have the mutual understanding with the policemen and the state excise uh, the state treasury it is said that it loses a whopping amount of 3000 crores every year which they could have possibly earned had they uh, regulated liquor consumption and would have uh, levied an excise duty on that uh, from 2000 and, from 1999 to 2009 within a span of 10 years there were about 80000 prohibition cases that were registered but the conviction rate was as low as 9% which shows that really the law just serves as something on paper, but it hasn't been implemented very properly. Moving on to a uh, basic introduction of the Gujarat Prohibition Act of 1949. Uh, the act uh, prohibits all forms of export, import, uh, transfer, uh, transport, sale, manufacture, consumption, etc., of all kinds of intoxicating substances, which include liquor, drugs, toddy, opium, charas, etc. Uh, Aditya? Sorry, Aditya, I think you're... The slides are not uh, moving. You, I think um, you are so changing I'm, the slides. I'm still on the first point. If you can see the point with respect to Gujarat Prohibition Act 1949. Okay, just to the point you have mentioned. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. So basically, uh, if you see the statistics of the reported incidents of crime under the prohibition law, which are depicted by the table, uh, which has been taken from the National Crime Records Bureau report, we see that um, in 2017, there was a significant reduction in the incidence of crimes by 32.16%, which was only because of a reason that in 2017, the Gujarat prohibition law had become more stringent. And because of the new amendment, the police and the law enforcement agencies have started applying this law very strictly. But later on, if you see in the coming years, this um, the rate has been increasing, which shows that people again have found their own loopholes in the particular law. This study is very relevant because of for obvious reasons that liquor prohibition in Gujarat has been talked about. It is a very a very controversial issue which uh, different people have different opinions about. And uh, recently, also in our case of uh, Peter Jagdish Nazareth versus State of Gujarat, this issue was further developed, and they were examining the right to consume liquor as a matter of right to privacy and right to make our own decisions as to our food choices. Um, the study is structured with the introduction first and then we are going to apply different tools of microeconomics such as um, demand and supply price elasticity along with a lot of diminishing marginal utility, optimal level of enforcement, externalities, etc. and end up with a conclusion for the project. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So uh, the, the research questions would be the impact of prohibition on demand for illegal goods such as liquor, impact of prohibition on supply of liquor, and the, whether there exists a need for prohibition on the sale and consumption of illegal goods such as drugs and alcohol. Uh, moving on to the next topic of demand and elasticity of demand for liquor. If we see the demand for liquor in Gujarat, we realize that demand for liquor in Gujarat is generally inelastic because of the fact that most of the consumers are pretty used to consuming it. Liquor is something which is actually uh, addictive in nature. And even though there is a strict prohibition in prohibition law enforced, there are various people who still choose to consume the commodity, which shows the inelastic nature of demand for the particular commodity. If we see the supply uh, for liquor in the state of Gujarat, we understand that uh, given there being a situation, if we assume that there is a situation wherein 
there is no war or there is no liquor prohibition in that case the market can op the market can can operate freely the market can definitely uh, they can supply at any rate they want to and they can supply n number of commodities but we are in a situation where there exists a liquor prohibition which means that uh, there will exist a degree of monopolistic competition in the suppliers who are operating through the illegal market and if um, if there is uh, there can also be a possibility of developing a monopoly if the conditions become more stringent uh, in the legalist in the legalized market for liquor we also see there is some sort of uh, monopolistic competition because there are various brands who are manufacturers of liquor and uh, and alcohol and therefore there is uh, a degree of monopolistic competition moving on to the next uh, subtopic next slide uh, excuse me uh, the, the next slide will be about a uh, central uh, trade off a uh, trade off that a buyer will face is whether is to is to assess their own cost and analysis as to whether they should consume a particular amount of liquor whether the benefit of consuming that particular amount of liquor is greater than the cost they might face by uh, consuming that amount of liquor so let's the cost might be the cost that uh, they have to incur on their health as a result of poor health due to liquor consumption or they might also face a cost that is equivalent to the risk of getting caught uh, and uh, the risk of having to undergo imprisonment or let's say any other form of punishment such as fines uh, then if we study the price of an illegal good such as liquor uh, a market for an illegal good can only be studied with reference to the price of the illegal good so price of liquor in a market such as gujarat will uh, be depending on certain factors such as firstly the cost of producing the liquor or the cost of procuring the liquor in the state where it is prohibited and also the suppliers will also element and will add an element of the cost that they might face in case they are if they are caught in in the sense that if they are caught with the with the liquor if they are caught with the prohibited substance in that case they might have to pay fines or they might have to uh, undergo imprisonment and that cost the value of that cost shall also reflect in the ultimate price so if we assume a situation where there is no war on the illegal commodity uh, a situation wherein um, the prohibition law is not very strictly enforced uh, in in that case uh, what will happen is that uh, there will be a, a relatively less amount of um, price for the liquor because of the fact that uh, there is a low cost of the producers getting apprehended and there is a low cost of the consumer getting caught but at the same time so we can see that the demand curve can be relatively elastic in that particular case it might even be perfectly elastic but if the government has decided to was a war against illegal goods and the prohibition law is strictly enforced in that particular thing we'll see that the producers will have to raise the prices because they'll have a chance of getting caught they'll have a chance of raise their prices which shall in the short run decrease the consumption of the produce and the demand of the liquor and the demand for liquor might uh, shift towards the left as depicted in the figure on the screen uh, however the question of uh, Ill, uh, of effectiveness of the war on drugs or alcohol arises with respect to elasticity of demand if the demand for liquor is elastic that is if it can be changed with change in price then the government should uh, have more enforcement efforts they should spend more on uh, catching those criminals who are actually violating the prohibition law because their 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 efforts will not be rendered futile they'll be able to catch people and people will stop consuming liquor they'll relatively consume lesser amount of liquor in the fear of getting caught because of elastic demand but the problem still arises when due to the fact that liquor is uh, an addictive commodity of habitual consumption there might be an inelastic demand for it and due to that il inelastic demand sometimes a uh, greater amount of enforcement efforts wouldn't prove to be very useful because people will still continue to consume liquor but the change that will happen is that the producers in the fear of apprehension they'll have to raise the price of liquor which in turn will actually uh, have a detrimental impact on consumer welfare moving on to the next uh, slide of combating the underground economy uh, to counter the problem of uh, product, what happens over here is that uh, in Gujarat, we see that there operates a large underground economy for the consumption of goods such as liquor because of the fact that it is not legalized. Therefore, people choose to deal, buy, and sell liquor in the black market, which results in the, uh, con uh, the creation of an underground economy wherein all the wealth that is generated, all the income that is generated, go goes unaccounted for. But what we can propose is that if there is not a, if the impact of consumption of liquor in the society is not that negative, if it is not that harmful, in that particular case, the entire 
liquor consumption can be legalized in the sense that the producers be asked to pay an excise duty on the production of liquor and which in turn will shift the entire market for liquor from the underground economy to the real economy wherein they shall also have to pay tax, they shall have to pay excise, they shall have to adhere to certain labor laws, certain safety guidelines, certain environmental guidelines and the level of crime that is associated because uh, in this particular case, if the entire industry is legalized, then the law of contract can also apply to liquor. And in that particular case, the level of crimes that are associated, the ancillary crimes to, to, to that revolve around the entire market for liquor shall be reduced. Uh, a paper written by Gary Becker on the market for illegal goods also proposes a form of taxation, a moderate form of taxation, which shall raise the level of production from the underground economy, that is the shadow economy, to the real economy in order to combat illegal production. Moving on to the next point of externalities of liquor prohibition, liquor consumption, we need to see whether liquor consumption really has a detrimental impact on the health of the society. Let's say that if liquor prohibition has a negative impact on society, in that particular case, we should, we, may, we might continue with uh, prohibition or we might continue with a very strict form of regulation with a very few exceptions. But given the fact that if liquor prohibition does not have a lot of negative externalities, very little negative or maybe mildly positive externalities, in that particular case, the government might as well allow people to consume liquor with uh, leaving a certain amount of taxation, a certain amount of uh, excise duty. Moving on to the next point, uh, we can also come up with a Pijovian tax, which can realign the benefits that are derived by the consumer from private consumption with a very socially optimal level of consumption by compensating the social costs which occur with the consumption of liquor. If we, uh, if we see the next point, so with respect to the optimal level of enforcement, uh, the optimal level of enforcement of the liquor prohibition law should be at a point where the marginal social benefit that is derived from reducing the consumption of an illegal good is equal to the marginal social cost incurred by the government to enforce the prohibition law to catch hold of the criminals. In the sense that if we keep on enforcing the liquor prohibition law, then at one point we are not going to gain anything from it. The cost of enforcing it will actually get higher than the, the benefit that is derived from enforcing it. In that particular case, we should let certain efficient breaches to uh, to take place. Certain efficient breaches and efficient crimes should be allowed in that particular case, and the further uh, further enforcement should be avoided. Going on to the next point about um, prohibited good and substitutes, what happens in this case? Uh, I would like to cite a paper by Mark Thornton, The Economics of Prohibition, wherein the researcher had talked about how the prohibition in USA had failed and how because of the liquor prohibition, they shifted from goods such as, let's say, uh, beer to more amount of distilled spirits such as harder forms of alcohol such as whiskey. And what actually happens is that if liquor is prohibited, then the demand of the substitute goods, let's just assume cigarettes or marijuana or any form of drugs might increase and their demand curve might shift to the right, which can actually be more detrimental to the society than consumption of liquor. There was this iron law of prohibition which was uh, propounded by a scholar called Richard Cowan, which states that with increase in the intensity of implementation of the prohibition law, the prohibited substance becomes more potent. This is something very, very frequently happening even in Gujarat and states such as Bihar, where due to the prohibition law, people shift to more potent forms of the prohibited substance which is a spurious liquor or cheap quality liquor, which leads to huge tragedies. So ultimately it causes a more detrimental impact on the health of the society because it is a welfare of the people, it is a welfare of the citizens that has been tested and which has been put into question out there. Uh, moving on to the next point of diminishing marginal utility and market for prohibited goods, we see that um, every additional resource spent on enforcing the prohibition would mean that fewer and fewer resources shall be available for some other productive use. The benefit derived from additional enforcement of the prohibition law would keep falling and hence the government has to determine an optimal level of enforcement for the prohibition law, which would probably be where the marginal social benefit is equal to the marginal cost of enforcing the prohibition law. Uh, just a single, uh, I think uh, I have some sudden doubt. How our demand curve is upward sloping in this graph? Is it certain characteristic of the goods because of that demand is upward sloping? I'm extremely sorry, sir. I think uh, there has been a clerical error while 
some while the presentation was being made uh, it is a clerical error please uh, please ignore it i'm so sorry okay, yeah. Uh, in, uh, moving on to the next point of learning from uh, liquor prohibition in Bihar, uh, we see that uh, the liquor prohibition law in Bihar was not uh, implemented properly. The police and the executive machinery were actually not prepared to enforce the liquor prohibition law in the, uh, that particular state. Uh, we also see that that led to a lot of menace of spurious liquor being sold in the entire state of Bihar, and uh, there was a lot of burden on the fiscal treasury also on the on the government also because of the fact that. They were earning a lot of amount in the form of excise which they had put on liquor and that amount they were not going to earn anymore and it had also caused a lot of unemployment among the people who were previously employed in the supply chain of alcohol uh, and then we come to the debate as to whether taxation or prohibition is a viable outcome we understand that complete prohibition in any particular state because of the fact that they people will continue to consume the amount of alcohol they used to do before there will be an underground economy, there will be a black market that operates for the consumption of the prohibited commodity. And in that particular case, it is ultimately the people, uh, the common people are going to regret and the common people are going to bear the brunt of it because of the fact that they'll be consuming liquor, which is of a bad quality, of a potent quality. They, there'll be no dispute resolution system with respect to such markets and there'll be a lot of violence that also spreads as a result of it. And also if the prohibition law is enforced very strictly and the market for illegal liquor still continues, then people might also resort to other means such as income generating crimes such as theft in order to actually finance their need for liquor consumption or production. And also we'll also see that there might be a crime displacement effort. Let's assume there's a situation wherein we actually enforce the liquor prohibition law extremely strictly. Uh, in um, that particular case, there might be a crime displacement effort as to the police will keep looking for people who are violating the prohibition law, but people might move on to committing other sorts of crimes and deterrence for other crimes might reduce. So in effect, I, the researchers, we presently believe that the prohibition law is not very effective and it is something that can be done away with given the changing needs of the society. We are in the 21st year of the 21st century and therefore we uh, would like to conclude that um, Probably the state of Gujarat should do away with the complete prohibition of liquor and to replace it with a form of regulation, which is done by uh, means of taxation. There can be a license system for all forms of manufacturers, sellers, suppliers, and consumers as well. And the focus of the prosecution should be on those people who are actually committing crimes after consumption of liquor instead of those people who are mainly consuming liquor, which is something that is done by a lot of people across the entire globe. Uh, there should also be proper amount of rehabilitation efforts, there should be reformation centers and also all the enterprises that are engaging in the manufacture of alcohol, they should follow certain health, safety, environmental, labor, workforce, diversity and other kinds of norms. And uh, there should also be some sort of contract mechanism that deals with enforcing the contracts uh, with respect to the liquor industry. And hence, uh, we would like to reach at that outcome that uh, probably the state of Gujarat should do away with liquor prohibition and they should um, develop a form of regulation by means of taxation. That's perfect. I think your time is also up, Aditya. Thank you, Aditya and Meha, for your presentation. Uh, let's start with the question first from the audience, and then maybe if uh, Mr. Bhushan or I have some questions, we can pose in the end. Right? If anybody has questions, you can... Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, this is Sunit Abbar. I have one doubt regarding his last statement, what he made. The focus should be on the people who do crime after consumption than people for consuming alcohol. That statement he has made, but how valid it is because uh, you are waiting for a crime to happen after consumption and then penalizing rather than avoiding it. So how good do your statements to hold valid? My Aditya to your question, you can just justify, I don't know from a law point of view, but in general, that is what I am presuming because let him consume no problem, but after crime penalizing, it's not. You are like waiting for the crime to happen and then penalizing rather than avoiding. Probably the level of penalizement can be reduced or can be controlled, but I don't know. Uh, what statement you have made, I think it's contradictory to my belief. Uh, please. Can I please yeah. answer the question? Yeah. 
thank you very much, sir, for raising this very valid question. But, sir, however, I uh, differ in my opinion towards the entire situation. So, what I see is that we cannot prohibit liquor just because people might consume uh, might consume liquor and then commit crime. Because consuming liquor is something that people all across the world do. Consuming liquor is something that, peop that people do. But what we need to actually stop is that crimes that happen after consumption of liquor. Now, if, uh, if we say that people after consumption of liquor might commit some serious crimes, but in that particular case, we cannot ban liquor from the entire world. But instead, if there are people who are committing these crimes after consumption of liquor, then that is something that needs to be checked and that is something that needs to be stopped. But for we have to strengthen our enforcement agencies and our judicial and our criminal justice system in such a manner so that nobody dares to consume to commit such crimes, be it without consumption of liquor or after consumption of liquor. But consumption of this commodity should not have any bearing and people should be allowed to make their own choice as to whether they want to consume the commodity or not. Okay. Probably the level of penalizement man can be controlled is my opinion. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Uh, Ma'am, I have a question to Aditya. Shall I, ma'am? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Aditya, uh, so you said that uh, we have uh, two things to control the alcohol uh, prohibition. One is uh, putting taxes, okay. Another one is uh, uh, restricting. That means that uh, no one. Uh, that means that re restriction of supply. So, uh, which one is? Uh, which one will be the greatest to reducing these things? Whether the taxing or uh, reducing the supply. So, can you please reframe your question? Uh, so you said that so so restricting the alcohol consumption so we have two tools one is putting the taxes so by putting the taxes so automatically the price will increases so when the price increases automatically they won't uh, purchase the product okay otherwise so we can ban the uh, product that means that uh, we don't uh, supply that product so there are two ways to restrict the alcohol consumption so which one is prefer preferable so from your point of view whether putting taxes or uh, banning the product so from, from my point of view, definitely uh, taxation is a very viable outcome because of the fact that prohibition is something that has already been tried and tested in the state of Gujarat. And what reports we actually see in papers and all is that we are having a trade of, allegedly, we are having a trade of about 28,000 crores every year going in and out of Gujarat, which is about alcohol. So prohibition in the sense hasn't worked. What it has led to is that there is so much of revenue that is generated, which is going unaccounted for. There is so much of revenue that the sales that can be taxed by the government, that is something that can be earned by the government, and they can also be used it for other purposes, the, the amount of tax that is levied on the consumption of alcohol. And taxation might also actually stop uh, consumption of liquor in the sense that people, when if the price of liquor are too high and they are in a legitimate, legitimate market, then people might also prefer to consume less. But what happens in a prohibited market is that people will are going to consume irrespective of the fact because they are consuming the product in their homes, they are consuming it in, while hiding away from the general uh, public. They are not consuming it out in the open and hence they will still continue to uh, consume it. But let's say if there is a restaurant which is um, selling liquor and if a person goes to that restaurant and for the purpose of eating and uh, consuming liquor, then we have seen the prices of liquor in restaurants and um, the specific places known as bars where they sell liquor, they are pretty high amount of prices. The, the rates are very high. And in that particular case, that will act as a deterrent and will will definitely stop consumption, not stop consumption, but reduce consumption by a significant rate, in my opinion. Okay, Aditya. But uh, some studies, so they have stated that, so for example, uh, if the elasticity, uh, that means that if the elasticity is inelastic means, uh, so some people are addicted. So in that case, if you are putting taxes means, okay, so they may uh, involve in some crimes. So for getting money, so what they will do, so to in, if he increases the tax, so if the case is inelastic case, that means that if their people are addicted for uh, drugs. So in that case, uh, if he increases the price, automatically it increases the crime rate. Uh, so so what's your uh, opinion on that? Uh. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I also believe that, sir, in, in this case, if we also see that people who are actually habituated to the commodity, even in a prohibited market, they are still going to consume the particular commodity and they are still going to pay high prices and they are still going to consume low qualities of the commodities and the entire money that is generated goes unaccounted for. 
and then why not allow the same thing to happen in a legalized market with a with an amount uh, with a heavy amount of regulation and also we can definitely have an implementation strategy which which curbs or restricts the amount of crimes that also occur ancillary to getting money for the consumption of liquor and in that particular case both of these two situations might be a little detrimental for the health of the individual consumer but if we analyze both these situations from a larger perspective uh, taxation will be economically better and that will provide uh, more revenue in my opinion and in in my opinion therefore taxation is a, a viable uh, for the present scenario because Thank you. prohibition hasn't worked in gujarat at all so definitely taxation yeah. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you. Any other question? Mr. Bhushan, would you like to have asked some questions while the others no. are <clears throat> formulating them? Yeah, I have certain observations regarding his presentation. Aditya, when you are uh, starting with, uh, let's suppose, assuming that it's a, it's a uh, in elastic demand, then you have throughout your presentation, you should follow the same thing. It's not that one time you, you make it an elastic demand curve and then another time you make it in elastic. So the, even the audience will not be able to understand what you're trying to present. Okay, this is the one very major, I think, mistake which you are, you are doing. So keep that thing in mind. And second thing is that the point which you are speaking about is you are trying to your focus is on the how to make the illegal to legal one so that a revenue can be generated but the purpose of liquor ban is not that purpose of liquor ban is social well-being okay so if you see in a in a foreign uh, uh, in a international market also if you see the taxation and provision both go hand in hand there should be optimal balance between the two when to tax and how to uh, you provide the part. Certain sections are being provided in terms of age, demography, or in terms of places. Okay. And then they are taxed also. So these are the two things which I had to, I had the observation of regarding that. For raising that question. Actually, my uh, focus, as in my personal opinion towards prohibition stands as something which is not uh, really enacted for the purpose of social welfare because uh, I, because of because of some my generation and because of the fact that uh, what I personally opine now is that liquor prohibition is a personal choice. I know that there are people who uh, over consume and there are people whose lives are being destroyed by the consumption of this commodity. But in my opinion, I have developed this opinion that now people should be left free to consume. Every individual has the right to decide whether they want to consume or not. And the government cannot decide that consumption of liquor will lead to social welfare or not. I just see it as a commodity and it is the right of every citizen to purchase a commodity or not. But that is like my opinion. No, I think, yeah, I think the normative leanings of the authors were quite clear from the beginning of the article. Uh, if there are no questions, I would have a few ones. No, Ach, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Go uh, I am uh, Samantha. I work as an assistant professor here in TNNLU. Uh, I actually, I, I don't have any questions to the uh, presenter. I just wanted to supplement what he was telling. I totally agree with him because, you know, right to consumption uh, of uh, alcohol is a political right. You know, you, uh, in the name of so social well-being or in name of religion or culture, you can't force any individual to, you know, take something or not to take something. No, it, I find it, you know, falling in line with uh, banning of beef eating, you know, all these things falls under the same purview so i totally agree with the uh you know the presenter uh, very nice presentation congratulations thank you so much everyone for giving me this opportunity perfect uh any last words okay so i had so i agree with both what dr shanti and dr felix and uh mr bhushan were actually trying to highlight which is there are two parts of the debate. One is the political economy. What is it that they are saying is 
the reason for the law versus what is the real reason for the law and you know what are the rhetorics and what are the non rhetoric reasons why a law still exists that is a topic on which i am completely on board and i think most of us are on board the hesitations that dr felix and mr bhushan were trying to highlight is your paper is not a political economy paper you are focusing on the microeconomics and the macroeconomics discussions around the prohibition so therefore the normative arguments can only substantiate the economic points you are trying to right and one of the flaws that dr felix was it's a it's a logical fallacy in your argument in a way where you're saying price does not change consumption pattern because there is relative inelasticity and then you are saying your solution to address the problem of consumption is introducing taxes which will increase the price and therefore could change consumption so it will so it addresses one part which is loss to the state yes now the state coffers will get the money which are going in the pockets of officials but is it addressing the consumption side issue what you could argue and like what it seems to be clear you want to argue is that there is no consumption side problem and if there is it's an individual problem and not a social problem that needs to be regulated at all which is good but if you're saying that increasing taxes is going to address consumption then you fall back into the logical policy because you earlier argued that demand is inelastic right that that's that i think was where we were all trying to push back which is you'll have to set your arguments right even if you are for or against the law if you're sticking to economic to micro and macro economics then you have to argue on that i would highly recommend that uh, you also try consider developing a political economy argument and paper around this which is like what are the rhetoric does it really help does it help domestic violence and for example one of the points you that could have strengthened your point is you take tax and then you use the money you get to educate people on alcohol consumption to improve rehab facilities to help people with alcohol abuse issues to come out and that could help consumption maybe but yeah like a paper that could you should definitely read, read is this economist yander and he's written this whole theory on bootleggers and baptists uh, would give you ideas for your next paper. but very nice presentation if nobody has any more questions we will move to the next one okay perfect So our next presentation is legal intricacies in treating data as a subject of contract bailment uh, by Ms. Palkavi Ayer. Uh, given the time we are in, and with all the Pegasus scandal that is not in the news but should be right now, I think it's a very interesting topic, and we are looking forward to hearing from you, Ms. Palkavi. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, ma'am. Am I audible? Could you kindly confirm that? thank you ma'am um i would be sharing my screen so i would uh, request you to confirm that as well once it is visible is my screen visible i'm afraid i will not be able to see anyone so um, it would be required i mean someone will have to unmute and let me know regarding that if that would be all right yeah you are yeah, visible i hope you can perfect see. thank you so much good afternoon i am indeed thrilled to be uh, presenting my paper titled legal intricacies of uh, in treating data as a subject of a contract of bailment here at the international conference of law and economics 2021 I am Bhargavi from NMIMS School of Law, Mumbai. The other day, I was interacting with a chatbot, the usual one that pops up on a website to help users find answers to their queries. 
and I asked it, what information do you collect about me? It answered that it can collect my name, email ID, username, location, birth date, internet browsing activity, etc. I asked it what it does with this information and it replied that the information is used for customizing user experience and tailoring what we see online, specifically targeted at us. Now I asked it uh, who can access this information and it responded saying only those whom I have agreed to show my information to. I certainly hope so, but it's hard to say exactly whom I have agreed to share my information with online. Now, personal data is something that has always occupied a very precarious position, be it on the legal front or on the technological front. It's quite strange that in a very and skeptical world that we live in today, uh, where we are protective of each rupee in our purse, we ignorantly click on the allow button uh, when asked by a pop-up on the screen for permission to access personal data. Now, of course, technology makes life easier, but we should not be paying the price of that convenience by compromising our privacy. I found that Indian law with respect to uh, data privacy is quite fragmented. And although the personal data protection bill is in the pipeline, I believe that there are some aspects that need consideration when it comes to data protection. So I realized that the entities in whose hands our data is entrusted act in a very similar manner as a bailey in a contract of bailment would. So I found this nexus quite interesting between the handling of data and the law of contracts, especially dealing with bailment, something that even our Indian Contract Act provides for in sufficient detail. Therefore, my research paper, it uh, aims to examine the current legal framework and its accommodativeness to the consideration of data as a subject of the contract of bailment and ex explicating the benefits and demerits of considering data as a subject of bailment and its possibilities and limitations. My paper aspires to suggest plausible formulation of amendment of the law of contracts and its regimes to provide adequately for data privacy and treating the contract so resulting as a contract of bailment. Now, a few questions that popped up in my mind were that does the law of contracts in India actually allow for data to be considered within the definition of goods to be bailed as per a contract of bailment? And what are the advantages and drawbacks of considering a contract of bailment for the protection of the data? And is it a viable option considering other means of data protection are available? So these are, these are some of the questions that I have attempted to explore and answer through my research. As the protection of data and maintenance of privacy is of essence, and it is always useful to learn from other jurisdictions I have noted the data protection laws of uh, some other nations also and assessed the inquiry made by several courts into the role of bailment theory in data privacy and protection. So in order to understand the nuances of the law of contracts and its interplay with the policy fr framework regarding data and its protection, it is also important uh, to analyze the meaning and the connotations of data in itself. So in common parlance, data is disorganized information especially facts or numbers collected to be examined and con considered and used to help in decision making or information in an ele electronic form that can be stored and used by a computer. But what is data in the eyes of law? This is also something that I looked into. In legal terms, personal data uh, was defined in the Data Protection Act 1998, which is existent in the UK. So this definition has also been acknowledged by the Indian Legal Forum. As per section uh, two of the IT Act 2000, data has been given a concrete definition as well. Now, some, uh, now coming to the subject of bailment, what exactly is uh, bailment as per Indian law? Now, before uh, looking into the Indian Contract Act, I just checked uh, the meaning as per the Black's Law Dictionary, which says that uh, bailment is the delivery of personal property by one person, namely the bailer, to another, namely the bailey, who holds the property for a certain purpose, usually under an express or implied, in fact, contract, and this is called bailment. Now, I also looked into Section 148 of the Indian Contract Act, which specified that bailment is defined as the delivery of goods by one person to another for some purpose upon a contract that they shall, when the purpose is accomplished, be returned or otherwise disposed of according to the directions of the person delivering them. The person who's delivering the goods is called the bailer and the person who, uh, to whom they are delivered is called the bailey. Now these I have tried to compartmentalize into uh, certain elements of bailment. 
unlike a sale or a gift of personal property a bailment involves a change in possession of the thing uh, that is bailed but not in that uh, not in the title per se so your data does not actually belong to the company or internet service provider it belongs to you they are just in possession of it and this provides an additional safety net in a way of course the first question that will arise is whether your data is actually considered to be goods and can you deliver data while accepting such a definition of bailment the american court at uh, north district of illinois uh, in the case of richardson versus dsw it acknowledged the fact that intangible property can also be the subject of a bailment further examining the definition of goods in the indian sale, sales of goods act 1930 It is also seen to mean every kind of uh, every kind of movable property other than actionable claims and money, and includes stocks and shares, growing crops, grass, and things attached, and so on. So this definition does not restrict the scope of property to mere tangible property, and hence it is considerably in consonance with the American prece- precedent. Now, uh, it is also per- pertinent to note whether a delivery is actually effectuated during transfer or retention of the data. what will amount to a delivery of a thing has been in many cases held to be a matter of law there need not be an actual manual delivery of the thing and it is sufficient if there are any of those acts or circumstances which in the construction of the law are deemed to uh, be sufficient to pass the possession of the property how a delivery is to be made to the bailee has been described to be by doing anything that has the effect of putting the goods in the bailee's possession so um, since data can be considered goods uh the, the definition that we see uh regarding putting the uh, goods within the possession of the bailee or any other person authorized to hold them on the bailee's behalf this uh definition would also include the bailment of data by third party websites and entities but the difficulty arises where the element of possession is actually considered under indian law the person in the de facto con- control of the property would normally be treated as the person who is in possession in the case of data there may be raised a significant hurdle in this respect uh, that is the data despite being provided may remain with the provider as well there is an absence of a concrete transfer of possession as the user providing the data may retain possession of the data as well while delivering the data to the website or online source that is uh, that is requiring such data to be collected for example um, you can upload your photo online but you can also retain a copy of the same with yourself but when effectively giving possession of data online the user basically does not need to part with it or give up their own possession by a plain reading of the indian contract law i found that um, delivery does not necessitate the exclusion of the bailer from the possession and use of the goods but merely makes it essential for the goods to be put in the possession of the bailee so just because you are not parting with the copy of the photograph or the data that you are providing um, it will not make it any less a delivery so a delivery of goods does occur in this case also now as the delivery needs to be done by one person to another the question arising is with respect to the legal personhood of the entities that are collecting the information in case the information is provided to a company the legal uh, personhood of the company is quite definitive and discernible but it is much more uh, complex to consider the legal personhood of algorithmic entities now algorithmic processes that are implemented in software or hardware including those that underlie modern computer systems are not traditionally conceived as legal persons which poses a problem as by indian law it is a prerequisite that delivery of goods should be from one person to another but it has been uh, demonstrated that legal personhood can be conferred by anyone on an autonomous computer algorithm by putting it in the control of a company or such entity and attributing the control or creation of the algorithmic entity to such legal persons so such assignment of uh, legal personality does potentially solve the issue of legal personhood of algorithmic entities also that require data and collect it to discharge their operations and functions when they are providing a particular service so considering the purpose to be an essential um, the purpose also being an essential to constitute bailment it can be said that as data collected is usually with the objective of facilitating the provisions of certain online services and the same is fulfilled now as per the it uh, rules reasonable security practices and procedures rules it is necessary for companies and corporations to specify the purpose of collection of information 
to the user in the mandatorily mandatorily uh, published privacy policy so uh, the purpose of bailment although it is uh, observed to be unclear in a lot of cases it still exists so as per the provisions of the it rules that i mentioned a uh, body corporates are required to provide a privacy policy that ensures the consent of the user before the disclosure of information so such consent may also be withdrawn later usually any sensitive personal information is required to be obtained stored and processed under a lawful contract so such a privacy policy as it is published materializes into a valid and lawful contract and therefore the bailment is uh, made upon a contract it can be said to be made upon a contract coming to the next aspect of the definition of bailment within the indian contract act is it possible to return data though now the court in uh, the case i mentioned earlier richardson versus dsw it found a significant hurdle in deeming data to be bailed where it was held that the absence of an agreement to return the goods to the bailer posed an obstacle in such a consideration so it is seen that even in another case in the uh, district court of minnesota um they also dismissed such bailment claim in the case of data breach on the grounds that data as intangible property it cannot be returned in any interpretation of the word but as per indian contract law though bailment may end in proper uh, uh, return it may also end in a proper disposal of the goods uh, as instructed by the bailer so the privacy policy in addition to the specification of the use of the collected information also usually specifies the manner of retaining and disposing the information of it usually provides uh, let's say a 6 month period after which the information will be destroyed or something of that sort so the privacy policy is required to de declare the purpose and the usage as well as the mo mode of disposal so this option of termination is also required to be provided whereby the user may withdraw their consent so where data is not dis uh, disposed of despite the withdrawal of consent the service provider will need to be held liable as per section 160 of the indian contract act so the user has the right to deletion of all data upon request and so um, you can see that the last essential is also fulfilled now it can be uh, pointed out that the main uh, difficulty arising would be uh, with the assignment of rights and duties to both the bailer and bailee for instance the service provider seems to be at a disadvantage as it appears that they have more duties and fewer rights however the bailee the, sorry the bailer does not ha does have certain duties for instance the bailer presumably must ensure that the data provided by them is authentic and cannot potentially harm the collector of such a data so the providing of corrupted data or data that might contain undesirable contents for example a computer virus or ransomware this brings into the picture the liability of the bailer so the difficulty arises also in tracing such a source amongst the vast amount of data that is collected and secondly in discerning the difference between gratuitous and non gratuitous bailment in the case of online access so the first difficulty is more technical and requires a technological investigative measure in place which can be provided for under the current regime itself and the law has the potential to be more specific in laying down the essential guidelines to uh, trace uh, use such tracing when it is necessary and to prevent misuse of the tracing as well whereas uh, in the case of the second difficulty it involves the intricacy of uh, financial aspects also despite there being no specific term in the privacy policy that is hinting at any payment or hire of data in most cases the fee that is charged by the internet service provider in turn being utilized in payment to the entity that is providing the service and requesting for data this qualifies the bailment as non gratuitous bailment so the service provider acts as a bailee for hire in respect of the data hence as in the case of non gratuitous bailment the bailer is held liable for known as well as unknown faults which the user has a duty to disclose to the service provider so the user can also be said to have certain duties further viewing the duty of the bailee of such information to take care it is seen that the failure to maintain reasonable care of data security that was alleged and lack of allegation of conversion or any other intentional conduct indicating unlawful retention of possession these were held as a reason to dismiss the application of bailment theory in the case of uh, data breaches in other jurisdictions in for example a case of sony gaming networks and customer data security breach lit litigation and such shortcoming is inapplicable in the indian law 
because as per section 151 uh, of the Indian Contract Act, a bailey is required to take as much care of the goods as he would of his own goods and of the same bulk and value in the similar circumstance. So mere indication by the bailey about a difficult situation arising out of the uh, handling of the data is not sufficient to repudiate the bailey's liability. So this sees to it that the service provider is not freed merely by conveying information regarding a, a data security breach. And uh, the con considering that the uh, same as a bailment would be beneficial as the degree of care is established and is not measured merely as per procedures and measures to be taken for the safety of data, but as per how one would care for his own goods, data in the present case. So the standard of care established is pretty high. Another point in this regard is with respect to where such a liability would end. Now, section 152, it describes that the bailey is not to be held responsible for the losses faced by the bailer when the amount of care required has been duly taken. This would be contentious if it is left primarily to the discretion of the courts. So it is necessary to bear in mind that the reasonable uh, security practices and procedures that have been laid down under section eight of the, uh, under rule eight of the IT rules should be followed and the standards of such in IT uh, security management systems should also be established. But uh, such care is to be judged not only from the inference of whether such practices and procedures have been adhered to and such standards as prescribed were followed, but also from whether the same degree of care to protect the data has been taken of their own data. It would be useful to formulate an additional provision to regulate the sharing and control of the data as well as its storing and disposal by the entity that is collecting its information to be at par with a prudent person's care of his own data. Now, a court, a district court in uh, California identified one of the key shortcomings in the application of the bailment theory to data breaches to be uh, that the claims of data breach were akin and duplicative of those that were made um, for negligence and violation of consumer protection statutes. So thus the damages would be recoverable under those laws as opposed to a contract of bailment. Now in India, section 43A of the IT Act specifies that the compensation to be paid by the body corporates upon the failure to protect data by negligence and section 72 also provides for penalty of uh, breach of privacy and confidentiality. But this act mainly creates a personal liability for mainly creates uh, excuse me ma'am i just want to confirm whether i'm still audible i think i'm facing a few network issues yes you are no, you and are uh, my ppt audible. is moving yes it is yes ma'am thank you sorry about the interruption there uh, so i was saying that Although there do exist provisions under the IT Act, the liability that is established is not sufficient enough and it mainly provides for the penalties. It is more penalizing as opposed to compensating. As Indian law suffers uh, from an inherent deficiency of adequate provisions of penalty or compensation in the case of data breaches, such negligence claim claims are frequently seen to be ineffective in dispensing justice. So taking into consideration the bailment theory would actually be beneficial as it provides the scope to establish the quantum of compensation prior to the data breach, thus ensuring that the, there is clarity and lucidity when determining the damages. So further, instead of uh, assigning personal liability, a, corpor a corporate liability can be established, which will further ensure concrete compensation to the user. The process for obtaining damages in the breach of a contract is far more exp expedited as compared to other remedies. So the provisions of section 73 and 74 of the Indian Contract Act, as well as the Specific Relief, Relief Act will, will be invoked in this case. So as opposed to other remedies, I believe that the uh, contract of bailment, considering it uh, in protection of data would be more effective. Now, for instance, in the case of um, Central Public Information Officer versus Subhash Chandra Agarwal, the Supreme Court vaguely and briefly considered the holding of information as akin to the bailment of goods. However, the court did not regard the data privacy policy as a contract of bailment specifically. So it is imperative that the laws for data protection be bolstered as it is evident from the various data breaches that have occurred across the nature, nation during the past two years alone. For instance, um, 
the edutech startup on academy disclosed a data breach that compromised the accounts of 22 million users in may 2020 and another example of the same would be when enterprise security uh, the firm fire eye re revealed that hackers have stolen information about 68 lakh patients and doctors from a healthcare website based in india in august 2019 according to the indian computer emergency response team over 3.13 lakh incidents were reported in 2019 alone more recent data was a little difficult to find however uh, this itself is a huge uh, reflection of how our data security laws need to be strengthened and the in insufficiency of the current data protection laws and the rampant threats of the data breach require a higher degree of care and Hence, as, per, uh, as the consideration of a contract of bailment would serve the purpose of safeguarding customer data and providing adequate compensation in case of a breach, the privacy policy has the potential to be considered as a contract of bailment and being further designed in such a manner in the future. Recently, the Joint Committee of the Parliament that studied the proposed Personal Data Protection Bill is believed to have adopted a final set of recommendations recently. And the draft bill is set to be tabled in the parliament's winter session. The bill considered a data principle, a data fiduciary, and a data processor, and is set to include non-personal data and data localization norms also. In light of the legal complications that may arise with respect to this, it will be most appropriate to treat data as a subject of bailment. Now, W. Edward Emmings, he had said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. I think a new meaning may be assigned to this quote, as except for God, we must trust our data with nobody else unless they can show us that the data uh, and assure us about its safety. Thank you for the opportunity today. Very interesting presentation, Bhargavi. Do we have any questions? Avin. If I'm pronouncing your name right, you're timing the speakers, right? Feel free to time us also. We are as bad with time management. So when the 10 minutes for the discussion is over, you could put it in the chat box. Definitely, 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 definitely. I'm not seeing anyone volunteering. Pushan, would you have some questions? Uh, I think we should move on to the second, uh, the third presenter because she will then she will not have much time. Okay, perfect. And we can we could, if anybody forward. has, ha, if anybody has any questions, we'll put it all together in the end. All together at the end because the other presenter will have the time too. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Dr. Chatha, I think we are ready to start with you on yes. a classical question in law and economics, which is mitigating risk and how to address that. Yeah, good afternoon to the esteemed panelists. Hope I'm audible, loud and clear. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh, yes, I just wanted to know if I'm audible. Yes, thank you. Thank yes, you. you're audible and we can see your screen. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so I am uh, Chaitravi Faculty School of Law. The topic of my presentation is mitigating adverse selection in life insurance and health insurance contracts, legislative framework, practices and current challenges in India. Uh, so I'm just moving to the motivation and problem statement. Uh, Adverse selection for insurers, specifically the tendency to select high risk individuals, which arises due to asymmetric information in the insurance market is unquestionably a barrier for efficient insurance contracts. The insurance economics literature also postulates that it's the insurance company which suffers from the lack of the information, which could be detrimental to the financial health of the insurance company in the long run. So, in this regard, um, I have looked into the legislative provisions, statutory provisions and insurance trade practices in India to see if there are any provisions to address the problem of adverse selection in life and health insurance contracting. Uh, so, the scheme of my presentation is as follows. 
there is information symmetry, adverse selection and insurance market addressed in the first part, and then looking into the legislative framework, uh, insurance trade practices and current challenges in India, and then lastly moving on to the conclusion and suggestions. Uh, as we all know, the whole concept of insurance is based on the um, uh, concept of this risk sharing, where the law of large numbers, wherein large number of people who are exposed to similar type of risk come together and they kind of share the financial risk that arises due to contingency by way of premium that is paid by them. The premium that is collected towards uh, the uh, indemnifying this contingency forms the pool of funds which the insurance company acts as a trustee. Then uh, usually the sharing of financial risk is through the premium that we pay to the insurance company. Uh, usually what happens here is not all individuals in a particular year may suffer the contingency. I mean contingency. So it so happens that the risk of few individuals is shared to a large number of individuals. And as a result of which, as we all know, the whole insurance pool comprises of both high risk individuals and also the low risk individuals. And these high risk individuals are definitely charged premium at a very higher rate. And also uh, the low risk individuals are charged premium at a standard premium. That's how it's being charged. So now what happens when any uh, contingency arises, the amount, the policy proceeds is paid from this pool of funds as a result of which many times we know that the uh, uh, the uh, high risk individuals policy is in, you know, subsidized by the low risk, uh, you know, premium that has been paid. So in this regard, just moving further here, the premium that is charged by the insurance company is usually directly proportional to the risk. That is a person, say, age 40 years today, taking a policy, insurance policy, the premium may be slightly lesser to a person um, buying a policy at the age of 50. Definitely smoking habits, health habits, these are some of the risk factors that is usually taken into consideration by the insurance company when they're fixing the premium. So now what happens here is uh, any deficiency in assessing the risk at the uh, or estimating the premium, the insurance insurance company is very likely to run into financial difficulties. So that is why the uh, the policy holder is duty bound to disclose all the material facts with respect to the subject matter of the insurance. That is usually when I'm just uh, focusing more on health insurance and life insurance which is likely to affect the judgment of the insurance company in fixing the premium or determining whether the proposal or the risk should be accepted or not. Now, as far as the trade practices in India is concerned, we know that there, ha there is a proposal form. The proposal form has uh, elaborate questions which collects data with respect to a person's medical, I mean, his health history, his family health history, his uh, lifestyle, dietary habits, etc. So now in such cases, it, it so happens that the insurance company may suffer from the lack of the information. That is a policy holder or the insured is likely to have more knowledge about the subject matter of insurance other than the in compared to the insurance company. Like unlike uh, property insurance, the risk could be assessed, the insurance company, the agents, they come, surveyors come and assess and they know the risk factors. Unlike in health insurance and life insurance, since the subject matter are the human beings, not all individuals are subject to medical examination. Many of the times, the trade practices, current practices, sometimes a person aged 40 years may so not subject be subjected to medical examination. What he's just asked is to fill up the proposal form. The details are uh, taken into consideration. Truth is made a condition. If tomorrow the insurance company realizes that there is suppression of material facts, and the question that is asked for in the proposal form is uh, fraudulently answered, in such cases, the insurance company may repudiate the policy. Now, it's so happens that in most of the cases, since the policy holder is not subject to mandatory medical examination or advanced medical examination, it so happens that in these situations, the insurance company relies on the proposal form and there is every likelihood that the buyer of the insurance policy or the inch potential policy holder may withhold certain material facts either to escape the rejection of the policy or to see that he pays lesser premium. Now, what happens this informational asymmetry may result in faulty risk classification, which so happens that the insurance company may sell the policies to high risk individuals at a very standard premium and uh, therefore exposing themselves to increased claims as a consequence of which this makes the co whole uh, you know uh, insurance pool very expensive increased claims consequently affecting the premium that is charged by the insurance company and making the insurance products very unmarketable to the low risk individuals so in this regard i was just looking into if we have any legislative provisions which could 
be used to address the problem of uh, adverse selection that might arise due to um, asymmetric information that exists particularly with respect to health and life insurance. So I was just looking the uh, going through the legislative provisions. One such provision is the section uh, 45 of the Insurance Act, which says that the policy holder is duty bound to disclose all the material facts relating to the subject matter if, as far as its life insurance. So he's given a proposal form wherein he has to fill all the Mat, uh, sub questions that has been asked for. Now, in such cases, if the insurance company discovers that there is fraudulent suppression of material facts, they can challenge the policy and reject the claim within the period of three years from the date of the issue of the policy. Now, this has been inserted in the 2015 Amendment Act. This is a very good move to see that there is no adverse selection and the insurance company is able to reject certain policies, which is based on fraudulent suppression of material facts. But uh, the catch here is what you could uh, look into the situation before the 2015 Amendment is the policy holders, um, the insurance company could repudiate the policy even after the period of two years. Even on the ground of suppression of material facts, they could reject the policy. But what happened in such cases was this was kind of misused by the insurance companies. They just uh, maintained all the records against the policy holder for 10, 20 years. And when he, when the death of the policy holder happened and when the family members of the deceased policy holder approached the insurance company, they used these records and repudiated the policy, which the family members of the deceased policy holder had no evidence to prove to the contrary. So law commission 190 report suggested that we should have an outer limit of five years beyond which the insurance company should not be allowed to repudiate any policy. But somehow we see that in the section 45 of the act, three years is the time limit beyond which the insurance company cannot repudiate the policy on whatsoever ground. Even there is fraudulent suppression of material facts, the insurance company cannot challenge the policy or cannot reject the policy which means that they have to scrutinize the document within the period of three years. Now, the inevitable question that arises here is whether the period of three years is sufficient for the insurer to check the accuracy and authenticity of all the details that is disclosed by the insurer in the proposal form. Now, why I'm saying this is uh, there is certain instances where uh, the insurance company cannot really understand whether there is you know, duty of disclosure or breach of duty as far as the policy holder is concerned until the contingency happens. I just give a small example here. Say a insured has uh, taken an insurance policy. He died because of some certain lung diseases, but at the time of the entering uh, the proposal form, he had stated that he's a non-smoker. Now, the, it is very difficult for the insurance company to investigate the lung condition of all the policy holders or the potential applicants um, as to see whether they're smokers or not. So it would be very feasible for the insurance company to investigate the lung condition of those individuals who died of this disease to understand whether they were smoking or not. So what I'm trying to tell uh, state here is sometimes the insurance companies and that also uh, that also saves the uh, resources as far as the pool is concerned. So in such cases, many of the times the insurance company is only able to discover the information and check whether the insured had breached duty of disclosure only after the occurrence of the contingency. So I was also looking into the other trade practices as far as uh, you know uh, to address this whole problem of uh, asymmetric information adverse selection. Um, yes, one conclusion that was reached here is uh, the statutory provisions also three years time limit may not really help the insurance company to overcome this problem. And also not all individuals are subject to advanced medical examination. That's why in the proposal from truth is made a condition and there is a clause saying that it shall form the basis of the contract based on which the insurance company can repudiate the claim. So now there are various other measures also adopted by the insurance companies like no claim bonus, premium rebates offered to those not making claim in a particular year. One aspect that I would want to mention here is exclusion of pre-existing diseases in health insurance contracts. Usually the health insurance contracts do not cover pre-existing diseases to minimize the uh, uh, outcome, I mean, adverse consequences of again, adverse selection here. Also, they have adopted this practice of waiting period, wherein any or policy holder when he initially buys the policy, the insurance company may say that this is the waiting period, one or two years, wherein they will not be providing any coverage to any illness, including the pre-existing diseases. Again, just 
this is just to minimize the risk of adverse selection. Of course, there are certain group based insurances wherein because of the larger pool, the uniform terms and conditions have been applied to avoid the problem of adverse selection. So now there are other uh, means also we have reinsurance where the insurance company can again um, um, uh, insure its risk with another insurance company. This is again to uh, uh, overcome the adverse consequences of adverse um, you know, selection here, sometimes increased claims. So they also go and further insure their risk. Now, one of the practice that has been deliberated across the globe to overcome this problem of adverse selection is sharing of genetic test information with the insurance company. Now, uh, this uh, has been deliberated across the globe. Apart from privacy concerns, one uh, concern which the insurance companies are also raising as far as sharing of genetic test information is when a genetic test information is, of course, shared with the insurance company, they know they can anticipate the future diseases that a person may contract and fix the premium accordingly. But also this has a uh, adverse effect when genetic test information is made mandatory, low risk individuals would never go and buy an insurance policy. So now what happens only the high risk individuals would go and buy an insurance policy, wherein the pool would consist of only high risk individuals, consequently the premium getting higher and the product again becoming unmarketable. So these are some of the uh, aspects that I was looking into. Uh, when I just was going through the conclusion, when I was concluding my study as far as uh, the provisions in the Indian statute is concerned, or the trade practices are concerned to minimize this problem of adverse selection. Yes, we have mandatory disclosure wherein the insurance policy holder has to disclose material facts, otherwise, the insurance company can repudiate the policy. We have the waiting period, we have the exclusion of coverage of pre existing disease, maintenance of solvency margin, reinsurance, etc. But one aspect that uh, caught my attention here is this prescribing the time limit, outer time limit of three years only. Uh, to repudiate the policy is something not so good in the interest of the insurance company because many of the times the insurance is com insurer is able to defend uh, that they did not uh, you know they are able to uh, kind of understand or investigate whether there has been suppression of material facts only after the happening of the contingency. So what I could understand here is probably the insurance company, if it is able to defend that they did not have sufficient means to discover the fraudulent suppression of material facts within the time limit, instead of totally in cap, you know, depriving the insurance company of challenging the policy, they should be allowed to pay reduced insurance claims by deducting the premium accordingly. That is the premium which the insurer could have charged if he had known of the risk at the time of the inception of the contract. So also another aspect here is compulsory insurance is also seen as a solution to the problem of asymmetric information uh, because since the pool is of larger number of individuals, they probably do not need any risk classification by the insurance company and uniform terms and conditions may apply. But as far as this is concerned in India to make compulsory insurance uh, implementation is concerned, uh, one of the serious concern here would be the ability to pay the premium remains an impediment as far as uh, compulsory insurance is concerned. Uh, so that is it. I was a little fast, you know, to, uh, you know, compensate for the, uh, I mean, I just saw the time limit. So I was just going through the law and I was also looking into the uh, measures that we have in the statutory provisions, but yes, there are certain gray areas which could be looked into to avoid the problem of adverse selection. So that is it. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Setra, for giving us a few minutes so we could yeah, pull in you. the questions for uh, Bhargavi and uh, Dr. Setra. I just had a question from the organizers. So can we extend the session by five more minutes so that we have five minutes for each speaker or should we? Yes, ma'am. We can extend five more minutes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. So questions for either of the two speakers? Yes, sorry. Uh, basically, her entire focus of the study was to identify a problem, I guess. So, uh, when it comes to suggestions, I probably don't know the area of research, especially in the law, how you're going to justify your suggestions. Uh, because, for example, you are telling about the lung smoke, uh, smoking example. 
because smoking condition can be bad because of uh, a passive smoker also. So under such cases, how insurance companies should consider these aspects, or when you suggest something, how exactly are you going to validate your suggestion? Because I'm. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I think I I'm ha I think I'm facing connectivity issue. I could hear you partially, but yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, just what I could understand from your question. Usually in the proposal form, there are certain questions which the insurance company tries to elicit the information, the smoking habits, etc. So most of the times, the policy holder may avoid such questions just to see that the premium charge is lesser, or also to. Uh, escape the consequences of rejection of the policy. So, in such cases, the insurance company just relies on his statement and gives him the policy. I mean, uh, Ella uh, grants him the policy. But the question here arises upon the happening of the contingency can the insurance company avoid the policy if it? gets to know that there is suppression of material facts. It so happens many times, not all of us will be subjected to medical examination. The insurance company does not have enough resources to subject all of us to medical examination. That's why it makes truth as a condition relies upon it. But in such cases, as I was mentioning, that is also detrimental against, I mean, against the interest of the insurance company as well, because we see MNCs, they, you know, we, we kind of make interpretation against them and always in the interest of the policy holders. So, Prescribing this time limit wherein the insurance company has to award the policy within three years is somewhat not acceptable in the sense sometimes the insurance company may get the proper reports after the policy holder dies that medical report may reveal that he was suffering from certain diseases which might have not disclosed been disclosed in the insurance policy. So that way is prescribing time limit of three years would be a little difficult for the insurance company as well. In such cases, if the insurance company is able to prove before the insurance, I mean, court that we did not have the sufficient means to really look into the uh, uh, material facts disclosure at the time of the commencement of that should be considered. This was my opinion uh, as far as balancing the interest of both the uh, policyholders and the company's concern and not totally rejecting the policy, at least pay them the reduced claim after reducing the premium, which they could have charged at the time of the commencement of the policy. If they have known about this risk factor. That is the only. Okay, uh, just a curiosity, how do you justify these statements from a research point of view? Because when basically I am from a management, we have to give some evidences or support of previous findings uh, to support whatever these statements we make, or at least we should have some empirical evidences on this. Especially when it comes for the law, research in law, how do you justify these statements, what you are telling? Yes, sir. This is with respect to the statutory provision. That's that interpretation of the statute. Because I, I am what my contention is, the law is not clear. They could have also framed the law little in favor of the police. I mean, insurance company. So this is purely qualitative interpretation. So no empirical data. Okay, okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Chair, if you permit me a question. Yes, of course. The floor is yours. Yeah, so thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, just on the point that uh, since you say that three years is, uh, you know, three years would go against the insurance companies. How about considering it like this, that if it is three years, then the insurance companies would spend adequate resources, you mm -hmm. know, to ensure that they are, you know, safe. Mm -hmm. And if so, then, uh, then, then. Then, then, then you are in a position to come to this balance between the two. That is one. Second is, yeah. uh, from what studies do you tell us that uh, this goes against A party versus B party? You know, do you have some, uh, you know, work to kind of uh, evidence that some studies? Because generally the narrative is that it goes against the policyholders broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, deep pocket theory is primarily. Mm -hmm. So, if you could, you know, tell us about that. Yes, Thank yes. Uh, Ma'am, this is basically uh, on the case. Thus. Very true. Before the 2000 Amendment Act, since the time limit was beyond two years also, the insurance company preserved all the records against the policyholder. They only disclosed it uh, when the family members of the disease policyholder came and made a claim. So, to avoid such situation, three years time limit was put. Now, there is also contention by the insurance companies that, you know, they do not have enough time. These three years is not enough time to really look into whether there is disclosure of material facts or non-disclosure. Now, when I was looking into the statutory provisions, I realized after three years, the insurance company cannot repudiate the policy despite knowing the fact that the policyholder had 
fraudulently suppress the material fact. So my contention is only this, that probably the statutory provisions could have given the burden on the insurance company to justify it before the court of law that uh, the, if they had, they, they had enough evidence, they would have uh, really looked into the matter within the three years and they would have rejected the policy. But after, if the policy holder dies in the fourth year or fifth year and there is clear suppression of material facts, totally incapacitating the insurance company from rejecting the policy is something I was not uh, convinced as far as legal provision was concerned. So probably if the insurance company able to justify before the court of law that within three years we had no sufficient means but now we have the report which so shows that he was a heavy smoker and that's why we had we could we want to avoid the policy in such cases probably a middle ground instead of incapacitating the insurance company probably asking them to pay reduced claims if the claim is for one crore paying the reduced claims by deducting the premiums which they could have charged if they had known the policy holder was a smoker at that point of time so that is the only contention that i had been Making. Yes, this is definitely a very good provision, but somewhere in certain cases may go against the interest of the insurance company. That was the uh, observation that was made as far as the analysis of the provision, statutory provision was considered, uh, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Chetra. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Any other questions? I had a quick question, Dr. Chetna, for you, which is you through the article and also your presentation, it seems like the insurance company should recover the complete cost of every claim and then make a profit. Isn't the whole game of risk insurance aggregation? So even if I'm losing on certain patients, as long as overall on aggregate, I am making a profit and I'm able to sustain myself, mm -hmm. shouldn't, shouldn't then the interests of the insurer be considered met? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. So I was also thinking that probably this is a new provision. In the long run, maybe it may be detrimental to the health insurance company or the life insurance companies. Probably maintaining the balance now would also help maintain the solvency margin or the health financial health of the insurance company that was the only i was just trying to look into whether the indian statutory provisions are able to address this problem of ad adverse selection and when i was going through the provisions i felt that this is one provision wherein we need to relook probably the insurance company could also have certain justification to avoid the policy after three years so that was the whole observation perfect do we have any questions for Bhargavi? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I have a question to Bhargavi that uh, Bhargavi, are you available? Yes, yeah, she just requested to keep her yeah. video off. Okay, yeah. 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 So, Bhargavi, do you think that dig digital education will help in data privacy? than to making more stringent laws which people are not at all aware or not reading Bhagavi, if you're trying to speak you're on mute okay so i Yes, Thargavi is not with us. Okay. So, uh, another question to Chit Chatra, ma'am. Like, yes, uh, yes. Uh, like you, your major concern was from the insurer side. So, we are focusing on that itself. Then, do you think that digitalization of health services would help insurer to get more information or, or timely information? They will be able to reduce the information asymmetry by digitalize, digitalizing the health services? That would probably improve, sir. Digitalization would probably improve the access to the information. But again, the question here arises whether the policyholder is fully disclosing the material facts. Because most of the times in India, we buy health insurance policy when there are high-risk individuals or when we know that there is certain family health history. 
and you know we are kind of otherwise low risk individuals is very rare that they go and buy a health insurance policy so in such cases when the policy holder do not disclose that he has this family health history probably that would affect the fixation of the premium as far as the health insurance companies are concerned but yes definitely this is also kind of addressed by uh, the insurance company fixing a waiting period for one year or two usually one year or six months they say that we will not pay any claims for any illness whatsoever because most of the times just to mislead the insurance company when a policy holder knows that he's contracted with the disease, he kind of buys the policy just to get the immediate claims. So that is also one of the reasons, but definitely digitalization would improve further, sir. But again, that depends on the uh, policy holder disclosing the information. Uh, I just went, I was going through the chat box. Could I answer the question? Uh, I think, yeah, uh, the information that is disclosed at the time of the agreement is the final one. So based on that, the insurance company fixes the premium. They cannot alter the information later. So that is something I want to ask, uh, answer Abhishek, sir. But uh, in that case, if the digitalization of health services happen, then in that case, premiums, the benefits should also be passed to buyers because the means in that case, the insurer are well aware about the okay. whom to charge how much. Mm -hmm. so information is available, that means they will have the monopoly power. Correct. The correct. First best, monop first best mm -hmm. monopoly. Mm -hmm. So in that case, so, is it not that buyers would be more exploited? Uh, sir, trust to if the you. yes, sir, yes, sir. To encourage this, like when there is no claim made by the policy holder at all, the insurance companies are also giving them certain benefits like premium rebate or no claims bonus to see that a policy holder avoids this moral hazard aspect also that moral hazard aspect also is also contrary yeah so that is one thing i just wanted to mention i think that's it good afternoon good afternoon everyone uh sir is it like uh is the q a session over yeah yes i think we are there yes yes sir yes ma'am so uh good afternoon everyone uh so it was a really wonderful session now Sumeta ma'am will come for the vote of vote of thanks. Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to everyone present here. Uh, I would like uh, to begin by thanking Ms. Shubhangi Roy and Mr. Sunny Bhushan for chairing this technical session on law and economics of private law. We thank them for their engagement with the session and their deeply insightful comments on the papers presented. We are very happy to be in the presence of your expertise and knowledge. I would like to thank Aditya Dalal, Bhargavi Ji Ayer, and Dr. Chaitra for sharing their ideas with us and contributing to an urgent and continued dialogue on the value of economics to the study of law. Next, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Tamil Nadu National Law University and the Indian Association of Law and Economics, as well as our student volunteer for their painstaking effort towards successfully executing this conference. I would like to also thank the IT department of TNNLU, without whose support this event would simply not be possible. Finally, I'd like to thank our audience and very, I'm sure that your presence and questions provided much encouragement to the speakers, and we hope that you found the session engaging and informative. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meet you in the next technical session. Yeah, so we request uh, all you to join in the technical session too. Thanks. Yes.